He's speaking on effective stage anchoring. Stage anchoring is a technique that can enhance your presentation. Learn how to move around your presentation space in a way that enhances the effectiveness of your story and get your audience to remember the important parts. It can also help create a timeline using effective stage anchoring. Now, Sean Adams is a best-selling author, entrepreneur, former college professor, administrator, and international speaker. He has presented to over 10,000 people on five continents and will focus his expertise on helping you enhance your presence and effectiveness, regardless of the venue or of the size of your audience. So without further ado, we'll bring on Sean Adams. Please give me a warm welcome for Sean Adams. How many of you have something that you're passionate about and want to share with other people? How many of you would love it if your audience actually remembered what you shared with them? Now, how many of you knew that the stage can be the most important piece of causing that memory? Excellent. So, I'm Sean Adams, and I want to give you a little bit of my background on how I came to understand the psychology and the, the, the process of stage anchoring and why it works so effectively. So the first time I really started to understand this was back when I was in undergraduate. Um, I started out as a physical therapy major because you go to school to get a job that's going to pay you really well. Um, then I took physics. So then I changed my degree to something that, you know, was absolutely going to assure me of a job. Psychology and theology. That is just the money maker. But what I started to realize is that's when I started to realize how you connect with people and how to help people learn and remember things. The psychology side is pretty obvious. Psychology gets you to understand the psychology of people. But I also learned that the theology side was very important because it helped me understand how to connect with people, where their passion is, what really moves them, which is also important whenever you're going to be sharing something that you're passionate about. So after undergraduate, I moved on to graduate school because, you know, instead of actually getting a real job, I decided to just continue to be a student. Um, I should note, in undergraduate, I did get a degree I can't read. I went to a school that still believes in that. It was a private Catholic institution. So my degree was written in Latin. I didn't have to take Latin, but my degree was written in Latin. So I think I got an undergraduate degree, but I actually have no guarantee of that. But they still let me into grad school. So at grad school, I studied more psychology and student development theory. So I got a lot more of that aspect of what happens in the brain as people learn and grow and develop. But I also was able to get in front of classrooms. It was my first chance being a teacher. I taught a couple courses, and then I was also responsible for, I'm going to move this because we're getting a little feedback. And we're going to take the name tag off because you all know who I am now. Hopefully that will help. Excellent. There we go. Look at that. Um, I, can, I can get that later. So in, so in grad school, I started to be able to teach. And I was a faculty member and got to learn what did and didn't work inside the classroom. I was also responsible for planning all of the activities to keep all the students entertained when they weren't in the classroom. So I learned how important it was reading through all those contracts and writers and things like that about knowing that you plan your space correctly. So as, if anybody was stayed in the room, which you shouldn't have done, but if you did, you saw that I set some things up on the stage because I wanted to have my space be exactly how I want it to be in order to give this presentation. After I graduated from graduate school, I moved on and worked in higher education for 10 years, both on the faculty side and on the administrative side. And so I, got, I was teaching on a regular basis, I was planning conferences, I was planning much larger events, large concerts, things like that, but it still all came down to the basics. Um, the devil's always in the details, and if you don't have the details in place, you're going to run into that problem. So I, still, I really gained a lot more information on that, eventually got my PhD in education, and really learned how people think, interact, and function. So after that, I then retired from higher education, and I moved on to the world of personal development. And I decided I wanted to learn how to do this as a profession. 
And so the way to do that, I could have gone and like paid thousands of dollars to go and watch Tony Robbins on stage and take notes what he does. I decided to go the other way, which is I went to the people who trained Tony on how to speak and had them teach me. So I went to your T. Harv Eckers, your Brian, um, Blair Singers, folks like that, Clinton Swain, the folks who teach people how to manage an audience and a stage. So that, that was more expensive than going through undergraduate, graduate, and my PhD, but it was worth it because I learned a lot of the techniques that people don't tell you about. Then I joined Toastmasters. <laughs> and what was wonderfully, um, was the great gift of Toastmasters is A, I joined the world's greatest Toastmasters club, Toast of Petaluma. <laughs> I can always rely on that. If I, even if there's one in the room, they're gonna be the loudest one in the room, if not more. So always loyal supporters and I love them for that. But it's amazing how much I learned from doing Toastmasters speeches as well as all of the other education I've gotten. So all the way back from just learning the basics back in undergraduate, moving into grad school and learning some more of the, the stuff behind the scenes, the intellectual, working in higher education and really learning how to put on an event and everything that needs to happen, learning from the people who teach the people how to do this right, and then joining Toastmasters and really learning that has really helped me get to this point to be able to help you understand a little bit about stage anchoring. So why is all of this important? It's important because there are three, how many? Three. Ways of learning. The first is auditory, what you hear. Everybody is strong in one of, stronger in one of these three ways than the other two, but we've all developed the ability to learn all of these ways. The first is auditory, so what I'm saying. Some of you, you don't need to look at me, you don't need to take notes. Some of you even close your eyes and just hear what's being said, and that's how you're getting that information in. So that's the auditory learners. The second are the visual learners. That's the reason why we have this here. So, what was the first type of learning? Auditory. Excellent. And what is the second type of learning? Visual. You guys are fast learners. Now, the third is for all of you folks who have your little pens and notepads out. You're my tactile learners. You're the ones who have to physically do something for the learning to take hold. And that also isn't just note taking. That's your people who are into dance and use movement to be able to gain the information and process information through movement or some kind of physical body experience. That's your tactile folks. So the third type is? <coughs> you are excellent learners. And I know the evaluators would criticize me for turning my back to you, but I'm aware I'm doing it. <laughs> So there's one other thing I want you guys to understand before we really go into stage anchoring. And that is, this is, the scientific research has proven, and I'm gonna come down to the floor to this to help you guys understand this. There's, we learn best when we chunk or segment our information. So let's say that I'm trying to study for that physics exam that I never studied for as an undergraduate. And part of the physics exam involved knowing just basic equations. So the idea to this is our brains actually take chunks of information and store them in different ways. And so our brain likes the idea of, think of an office building where you have all of these different offices that exist. Each room in your brain is a piece of knowledge. So if I wanna learn physics, I would go into room 101 and learn the theory of relativity, because you know you might as well start easy. <laughs> then I would go into room 102 and learn the theory of gravity. And then I would go into room 103 and learn whatever other theories exist in physics. Clearly, I didn't learn any of them. <laughs> but let's say the second half of this education is actually going to be going to knowing uh, the history of physics. Like, who are the great physicists? So then I would go into 201 and I'd learn about Einstein. 
And I'd go into 202 and I'd learn about Planck. I don't know if that was a physicist or a chemist, but it's a science-y name, so I'm running with it. Um, and then I could go into room 303, and then there I could study, we've got theory, we've got the history, now I might want to study actual practical like applications of physics. So how can I use this to build a better car? And then the, I could go into 302 and learn how to build a better boat, whatever it might be. And the reason this is important is that when you are walking around, when you go to take that test, instead of having this giant like mess of information in your head, all you have to do is picture the room of 101, and you're going to be able to pull up that information about the theory of relativity. And then when the question comes up about the theory of gravity, you don't have to try to figure out where it is in this giant mess of information. You just remember room 102. So this was an ancient style of learning. Back, the Greeks would do this. When they were trying to learn and memorize, they would literally physically go to spaces to understand and anchor these ideas. They would force themselves to segment their information so they could pull it out of kind of their brain in a very easy, clear, and structured manner. So I'm doing all of that because think of the stage as your audience's brain. So there are two types of stage anchoring. How many types of stage anchoring? Two. Thank you for participating. So the first type is what we call, see this is why you turn your back, I can kind of hide this, and then do the reveal. What's the word? Timeline. So the first type is a timeline. And that's when you have a progression. This ha let's say you're telling somebody how to make a peanut butter sandwich. Open the bag, undo the twist tie, open the bag, pull out the bread, close the bag, close the twist tie, flip the bread, and you go through the step by step by step process that you need to go to help somebody understand and learn. That's the first one, that's that timeline or progression. Now, the second kind is, it's not sign points, it's significant points. If there's certain things you want people to understand, I don't know, maybe the auditory, visual, and tactile learning styles, you need to be able to give them that physical space that they can associate with it. Because now if I stand over here, what do you guys go and think about? Auditory learning. If I stand over here, you think about? Visual. And over here it is? So that's now anchored in your head. And if you're ever sitting there thinking, what are the three types of learning? All you have to do is picture the stage and where I was standing, and those, I, those answers will come to you because we learn better visually. Even if you're an auditory learner, having a map helps you. So how does this work? First of all, if I hadn't just told you I was doing that, you don't actually know I'm planting the seed of these three different concepts. It just naturally works in your head. Your brain is making the map for you as I'm talking. And I have the glory of this nice ginormous stage where I can be painfully deliberate about how I'm doing this. And I know inside, wherever you may end up speaking, you may not have that option. But you may have just this size space, but you can still own every square of whatever the size stage you have and be very clear on what each piece means so that the, the education and the knowledge and the wisdom sinks into your audience. Now, the other thing it does is it complements a thing called accelerated learning. How many of you have ever been in a room where you were listening to someone speak and for 45 minutes you stared at that person and did nothing but looking at that person? How many of you so far in this presentation have either had to say something or raise your hand at some point? <laughs> That's accelerated learning. You're going to learn more if I get you participating. Especially 
if I get you giving me the answers. How many types of learning are there? Three. Notice, I'm going to give you a hint. <laughs> I don't actually want you to get it wrong. <laughs> so if I say that there are multiple types of learning, how many are there? Three. That is a learning technique to help it anchor it. But by doing the physical, you're instantly, when I get you to say three, you're instantly picturing three locations on the stage in your head. I'm not a mind reader. I'm programming your brain for me. Because I want you to remember what I'm sharing with you guys here. I'm not doing it to brainwash you. I'm doing it to help you learn more effectively. And stage anchoring does that. Because we learn better through accelerated learning, and stage anchoring is a type of accelerated learning. It also does a wonderful job of connecting the three types of learning. When I'm standing over here in auditory, I'm still talking to you, yes? So my auditory people are hearing, but you're also seeing me. And I've also got you to do something tactile by saying the first type of learning is? Thank you. Now, same thing with visual. My visual learners, that's why this is in the visual learning section. The physical thing you're seeing where the information is at is in the visual section. You're still seeing me. My auditory learners are still hearing me. And the second type of learning is? Thank you. Now, the tactile is a little harder for me to demonstrate on stage, but that's the reason why I brought at least a prop. So I'm physically using something with my body to accentuate that idea that tactile is physical body aspect. You're still hearing me, you're still seeing me, and you're still interacting. So it connects all three types of learning. So you don't know what your audience is like. You don't know if they are, or if they are, or if they are, exactly. So you can't know that going into a room. But by managing the stage in a deliberate way, you are assisting everyone in the room to learn in the way that best complements their strength. This is why stage anchoring matters. Now, I'm, I, I've given you a fairly good example of how to anchor significant points. Where was I in my progression when I told you the story here? Graduate school. Where was I here? <laughs> Teaching, higher education, personal development, and then Toastmasters, of course. I'm going to hang out here for a little while. This is a good place to be. So, but when you are looking at the stage, we naturally think timelines left to right. We're a Western society, so this is how it's been programmed into us. It's a little different if you go into an Eastern society, but it's become Western enough that this is the accepted norm in learning time, a progression of time. So you know my growth as I got to being in Toastmasters because you can follow the path of how I got here. It could be the exact same thing as if I was explaining how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Open the bag. Well, first of all, sorry, it's open the twist tie, open the bag, pull out the pieces of bread, close. So people then will remember the progression of going from undergraduate to graduate to working in higher education to work doing personal development to then joining Toastmasters. And you always want to leave a little space. Because unless I keel over right now on this stage, something else is going to happen in my life. So you never want to end your lessons here because you don't have anything else that could happen. Always leave a little space. But that idea of giving them progression helps anchor how you move through something. If you were training somebody on how to do an excellent evaluation, you would sit there, you, you want to listen carefully, take notes. L actually, first of all, what you want to do is 
read what the responsibilities of an evaluator are. Show up, <laughs> listen carefully, take notes, organize your notes, present them clearly, and accept the rousing round of applause. This works for anything that has a process to it of A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D, etc. So you've got your timeline, or you have your significant points. And it doesn't matter what kind of speech or talk or presentation you're giving, you're going to fit into one of those two. You either telling the significant points of a story, or you're telling the experience that somebody had. Th those really are the basics of stage anchoring. Timeline, significant points. If you can remember those two things, think about whatever presentation you need to give, and then design your stage, your space, or your platform around presenting in one of those two models, your information is going to sink in. Are all of you clear on the three types of learning? Yes or no? Yes? yes. No. <laughs> Excellent. I love when that happens. So, you have it very clear. This, so is, but by the way, so is the one I get ticked on every time when I give a presentation. I'm even catching myself now. I just thought I'd share that. So, <laughs> I just did it again, didn't I? <laughs> Auditory, visual, tactile. And you notice I keep going back to those places when I talk about it to anchor those concepts over and over and over and over and and over again. Correct. This allows you to remember the three things. Let me give you an example of how it doesn't work. The three parts of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You have to have bread, you have to have peanut butter, you have to have jelly. Yeah. Now, the bread doesn't really matter. You get to choose whatever you want the bread to be. The peanut butter probably should be made with peanuts unless you're allergic to it, then it should be some other peanut-esque kind of thing. And the jelly is some kind of fruit thing that's, you know, cooked up, up down, sweetened, whatever the hell. I don't need I don't know how you make jelly. I don't make jelly. <laughs> now, in order to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I don't know where to go anymore because I've mixed my messages. This was originally bread and then it became jelly. <laughs> now, when I talk about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you don't know where to look to remember what the first piece is. That's bad stage anchoring. And whenever I give a lesson or teach, I always like to make sure people understand the bad way to do it first so that you can avoid this. And you'll notice I didn't poison my stage. I still have my nice, clean timeline of where I, how I progress through my education, and I have my nice, clear three points of learning. I use the middle to show you what's bad. So for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to avoid standing in the middle of the stage, because this is now equated with being something really weird and not quite clear. And the other side of this is it's really hard to take in a lesson about what works and what doesn't work if you're not really sure where the main significant points are happening, and if you know staying in one place is important, or meandering, or wandering around, or being somewhere else, you guys can't tell what the main points of what I'm saying right now are, because I'm all over the place, literally. When I'm wandering around and just kind of meandering aimlessly, you can't follow or identify the main points. The main points, I have to tell you what they are. So one, don't mix your stuff. If you're going to choose anchor points, keep them consistent. Number two, tell me where those main points are by stopping. This is one of the biggest mistakes people make in sharing information, is they just keep walking around wherever they want to go, and you never know when they're getting to a main point of stopping to share your main point. That idea of stopping to share your main point means less now to you guys because I haven't stopped 
to make the point that that's a main point. So stopping is a main point. It's perfectly okay to move around the stage. You have to to anchor things. But when you get to the point that you know they have to learn, you stop and talk about that specific point like the fact that those of you who are auditory learners are enjoying most of this because I'm doing a lot more talking. Those of you who are visual learners are also happy because there's movement and you're happy to follow something. And all of you with your little notepads out are happy because you have notepads to take notes on. <laughs> but you get that these are significant because I stopped to share. And I can still talk between them, but once I get here, I don't talk over visual. All I talk about here is that visual helps. That's all this spot on the stage is about. So I wanna make sure you guys are hearing this clearly. Once you establish a point on the stage, that point means that for the rest of the time you're giving your presentation. This works for a five minute presentation, this works for a 50-minute presentation, 